Hello, my name is Michael Kidd and I'm the immediate past president of the World Organization of Family Doctors. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person in Bratislava today, but I'm very happy to send you this message from my home in Sydney in Australia and to encourage you in the work that you're doing in supporting national guideline development, especially for primary health care and family medicine. The French philosopher Voltaire once said that the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. Now you and I know that there's a lot more to what we do than that. As a family doctor, I need access to trusted and reliable information to support my decision making so that I can provide my patients with the best possible care and advice based on the best available evidence, based on patient preferences and based on available resources. Wonka, the World Organization of Family Doctors, has produced its own guidelines on the development of guidelines. The Wonka guidance says that guidelines for family medicine should be able to demonstrate that they improve the quality of health care, that they reduce the use of unnecessary, ineffective or harmful interventions, and that they facilitate the treatment of patients with the maximum chance of benefit and the minimum risk of any harm. What has changed in recent years is the way that guidelines are developed. Guidelines nowadays should be evidence-based. They should be explicit and systematic in their development, and they should be inclusive of patient preferences and also considerations of cost. We know the benefits of evidence-based medicine to reinforce the scientific basis of medicine to allow an appropriate evidence or an appropriate emphasis on vital information to support our clinical decision making. And of course, evidence based medicine informs the guidelines which we're encouraged to use in our practice. But there are some drawbacks of evidence based medicine. Sometimes the evidence base is incomplete. The evidence may have been drawn from research carried out in highly specialised settings which may not be translatable into use in family medicine or primary care. Sometimes the evidence isn't as reliable as we need it to be. So we need to be cautious about the evidence which we're using to inform our guideline development. Guidelines ultimately should help us to reduce harm. Sometimes we have a problem in family medicine and primary health care with too many guidelines. There is a challenge of guideline overload. Uh, we have guidelines that exist for the breadth of clinical issues that we may face in a day in family practice. And there are new guidelines being released all around the world every day. Fortunately, there are some excellent sources of guidelines, such as NHS Evidence and the NICE initiative in the United Kingdom, to provide us with some guidance. The credibility of guidelines is also at risk. A 2009 Institute of Medicine report in the United States reported on conflict of interest in guideline development and especially inappropriate influence by some aspects of the pharmaceutical industry on clinical guidelines in the United States. Conflict of interest is very important and the Institute of Medicine has produced its own standards for developing trustworthy clinical practice guidelines released in 2012, which were in trying to determine what influence is appropriate and what is not from outside industry. We need to make sure that the guidelines that we're using meet the highest standards in their development. And fortunately, we have a number of measures which can help us to look at the quality of the guidelines, uh, the grade methodology and the agree critical appraisal of clinical guidelines are two international measures of the quality of the guidelines in use. But I think that ultimately our guidelines need to meet the rule of the three A's. They need to be available to clinicians and our patients, they need to be accessible to both ourselves and our patients, and they need to be affordable in what they recommend. Ultimately, we need to make sure that our guidelines don't cause any harm. Mandatory compliance with guidelines is also an interesting area. I believe that mandatory compliance can actually threaten professional independence. I know that many policymakers love guidelines and would like to turn guidelines into rules to control professional behaviour. But guidelines are not rules, they're guidelines. 
They're there to guide us in our clinical decision-making, working with our patients. And they're not there as a set of rules. Ultimately, of course, guidelines are only as good as the evidence that they're based on. As Wonka past president Richard Roberts from the USA reminded us, if we want to see evidence-based practice, we need practice-based evidence. That means that our guidelines need to be based on evidence from research which has been carried out in primary care and in family medicine. Professor Trish Greenhoe is Professor of General Practice at the University of Oxford, and she recently said that evidence-based medicine is based on reasoning from populations to the individual, but most patients in primary care don't quite fit the evidence. Evidence-based medicine plays to a vision of logic and certainty, but life is not always like that. I also like the research of Professor Barbara Starfield from Johns Hopkins University, again in the United States. Barbara did a lot of the early research showing us that those countries which have the strongest systems of primary care can be expected to have lower health care costs, improved health care access, and reduced inequities in the provision of care to a population. But Barbara also asked the question about how do we develop primary care-based research to address the challenge of care for people with comorbidities, recognising that many of the guidelines which are being promoted to primary care are for single diseases, but many of our patients have multiple diseases, and we actually don't have access to guidelines to assist us in caring for people with multiple comorbidities. So how do we decide whether a clinical practice guideline is appropriate in our practice? Well, I like to look at a guideline and then think, is this relevant to my patient population? Is it clearly written? Is it easy to implement? Is it written or endorsed by groups that I respect? Is it timely and current? And does it focus on outcomes that are important to my patients? More than, more than on outcomes which are important to doctors or to the pharmaceutical industry. If I'm going to use a guideline, I need to be sure that it accounts for all relevant harms and benefits, that it explicitly describes the evidence used to develop the guidelines, that it's been subject to external review, that it specifies the settings where it's intended to apply, and that it describes the strength or flexibility of the recommendations. So Muir Gray was the Chief Knowledge Officer in the UK National Health Service, and he once said to me, in the 19th century, we needed clear, clean water. In the 21st century, we need clear, clean information. And that applies to the information which informs our clinical guidelines. In a time of great change, our work as family doctors, our work in primary health care continues. Primary health care must remain the centre of health care delivery in each of our nations. But we must be supported to work with our patients to achieve the best possible outcomes. And that means appropriately developed guidelines which are targeted to the needs of our patients in primary care. Any change that we make in family medicine requires a caring as well as a careful approach. So I encourage you in the work that you're doing to make sure that the guidelines being developed are caring as well as careful. I wish you well with the work that you're doing. I hope you have a wonderful meeting today and I, wish, I look forward to my next visit to Bratislava to visit with colleagues uh, to finding out how this development is proceeding. My best wishes to you all.